Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. Exodus 15, 22 through 27. Man, I'm still fired up. Freedom! Freedom! Now listen to this. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea. He literally leads that chant and song. Then he leads them away to the Red Sea. And they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Marah, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Marah, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the Lord, the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Verse 27, after leaving Marah, the Israelites traveled on to the oasis of Elam, where they found 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They camped there beside the water. Really quick, and then we're going we're gonna to go into 16 and 17 in the coming weeks. They do the exact same thing. God provides, they complain. God provides, they complain. The other day, it was Halloween, right? And my son, he, uh, he was all fired up, and so I was fired up. My mom actually bought us, uh, let's see if I have it, yes, I got it over here. My mom bought us these masks, right? And so I, I yeah, cool, right? Crazy, mom. And so I had this mask on, and I didn't realize it, but let me see if I can do this without my mic getting all messed up. You, you still got me? Still got me? Okay. So I had this mask on, and it was cold, right? So I had this hat on, and I had all this stuff, and I, was, I, was, I forgot that I had this on my face. And I took my phone, and my phone has the face ID, and I clicked it, and it, it shook on me. And it said, face not recognized. I was like, what? Is, this thing is broke. That's my go-to, right? I'm always talking about how, uh-oh, am I still there? This sounds totally different now, right? That was crazy. Uh, so I'm like, what is wrong with my phone? It's broke, and I'm trying to get the, the face ID where I got gloves on, so I can't get the gloves. And I'm, I'm literally telling it, and Anna's like, take a picture of us. We're all in our Halloween stuff. And I'm like, I'm trying, but I can't get my phone to turn on this thing's junk. It's broke. I hate these. Give me a flip phone. I'm sick of these phones, right? Because I can't get it to work. And she was like, here, take a picture with my phone. And she hands me her phone, and when I take her phone, I, I looked at it, and it was, the camera was flipped, and I saw myself, and I was like, oh, that's, that's why it wasn't accessing. But what happened was I thought it was me trying to access something, but a mask that I was wearing was keeping me from accessing what I was trying to access. Here's my fear as we begin to study this passage, that you're going to see this passage and hear this message, and you're going to put on the mask of Moses. You're going to see yourself as Moses. And you're dealing with these snotty nose, thumb sucking, whiny, crybaby complainers in your home, and you're sick of it, and you're Moses, and what you need right now is a word from the Lord to fix all of these Israelites that are following you around. Right? I'm Moses. Now, I'm, when I read this, when I hear that, I don't complain. I'm Moses. Let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just push a little bit, okay, for all of us in here. Uh, here's the challenge with that. The primary foreshadowing of Moses in this story, okay, is Jesus. He is the primary foreshadowing. Not to say we can't draw application from Moses, but the primary foreshadowing of Moses leading the children of Israel to Egypt, or to act out of Exodus, out of Egypt to freedom, Moses foreshadows Jesus. So to put ourselves in the position of Moses continually throughout the story is to put ourselves in the position of Jesus. Who are the children of Israel? <laughs> Let's be humble for a minute. Who are the, the complaining, whiny babies? 
that continued to complain and continued to rebel and continued to run against what God was trying to do for them and continued while walking in the path to freedom, complain. Who, 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 who do you think that foreshadows? Can we, all, can we all just do this right here? Not one of us. Can we all just, on the count of three, who are the children of Israel? Oh, that's, ah, it stings, doesn't it? Man, I don't complain. I'm not a complainer. I'm surrounded by them. I'm married to one, and they drive me nuts. But me? No, I'm Moses. I'm the foreshadowing, walking Christ that never complains or never has a bitter heart or never is frustrated. Can we, we have to do this really quick. If you're going to receive what God wants you to receive, you have to take off the mask of Moses right now so you can access the part of your heart that God wants to work on. Because when reality sinks in, we all battle this spirit. When reality settles in, we battle. I'm not saying we're all succumb to it, but I'm saying we battle. Even in the little things, I was laughing. I was at a restaurant. I just read this, and I was like, man, I'm not complaining anymore. I'm going to tighten up. I'm going to be right. And I got water, and I ordered a water, and I took a drink of the water, and I was like, gosh, it tastes like it's from the faucet. I was like, this is nasty water. And I was like, wait, bitter water. I'm complaining. Lord, thank you that I can drink this stuff, right? Thank you. But I mean, there's, there's this rise in us that wants to just complain or that, that, takes, that takes for granted what God is doing and what he's providing and how he's working. It may be in the little things or it may be in the big things. It may be fantasizing about what Egypt used to be like. It's what they start doing, right? Chapter 16, chapter 17, they're like, man, why don't we just go back to Egypt? Would have been better there. They start fantasizing, man, I, I used to have a whole lot more fun when I wasn't following Jesus. Sure got to enjoy life a whole lot more. Now that I'm tied down and I'm trying to walk with Jesus, it's just not that much fun anymore. The problem is I'm not looking for fun, I'm looking for freedom. And that fun will enslave you. That fun will wrap you up and hold you in and you'll become stuck to it if you succumb to it. The freedom that we are talking about is breaking free from this mask of Moses and saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen for somebody else today. I'm not going to listen for my spouse. I'm not going to listen for my kids. I'm not going to listen for my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. I'm not going to listen for any of them. I'm going to listen for me just for a moment. I'm going to be willing to say, maybe, maybe, just a little bit of me has some of the children of Israel in me. Maybe I'm not as Moses as I thought. You know, the, the thing that may be keeping you from the freedom that you desire right now is your inability to recognize this complaining, bitter spirit. This complaining, frustrated, always annoyed, never grateful enough, something's always coming against me, Spirit, let me read you the, the, the context verse that umbrellas this and puts this all into perspective. We just read it. It's Exodus 15, 25. It says, It was there at Marah that the Lord set, people, set before them the following decree. In other words, this was the purpose of what we're reading, right? This was a test that the Lord did beforehand to see what they would do. Three days after chanting about their freedom, three days after, to see what they would do. It says he set it in as the following decree, as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. God is testing them to see if they will trust him or if they'll revert back to trusting themselves. If they will follow him and believe that he has the ability to make water clean. He just parted a sea three days ago. To see if they'll trust him or if they'll trust themselves. And the, the push-pull is, are you going to complain or are you going to cry out? What if I told you this? That every opportunity to complain is a test to trust God. What if I told you every opportunity, I don't think that's a stretch. I think that's very clearly what the Lord is doing right here with the children of Israel. 
Every opportunity you have to complain, every moment, every chance, every, but you're saying, I, I'm not the complainer, it's my spouse, and, and they just won't do what I ask them to do, so I gotta nag them and complain and complain and complain. Well, then, are you, are you trusting in your ability to nag, or are you trusting in God to change their heart? Or you say, man, I, I just, I, I, I'm sick of them telling me what to do, and I'm tired of it, and I just, I'm not going to do it anymore, and I'm not going to do it to spite them, and I'll just, I'll sit over here in Marah, and I'll be bitter, and I'll turn against Moses in this house, because you're not Jesus, right? Are you trusting in your own rebellion? Are you trusting in your own bitterness? Or are you trusting in the Lord to change their heart and make them sensitive to the way that they're communicating to you while still trying to be Christ to them? What if I told you that every opportunity to complain is a test to trust God? Every chance. Every moment stuck in traffic, at work, with your family, with your kids, with your spouse, with your in-laws, with everything that you have. Every opportunity to complain is a test to see what you're trusting in. Now we're there. Let's, let's move into this now. Ooh, this one is so good. Exodus 15, 22 through 24. So we get that, right? This whole thing, we have to understand that. Exodus 15, 25, this whole, this whole scenario is a test. Three days out of chanting freedom, here's your test. What are you going to do with it? You trust me? Or you trust yourself. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Marah, the, the water was too bitter to drink, so they called the place Marah, which means bitter. In other words, they characterized their entire existence in a place by an experience that made them bitter. The whole thing, everything's bitter now. Everything. It's not just, oh, the water didn't taste good. It's like, this land that we live in now is bitter. It wasn't like, oh, we didn't connect on this thing. It's like, this whole house is a disaster now. This whole place is bitter. It's messed up. It's frustrating. And then verse 24, then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? They demanded. The desert of Shur, it says that's where they journeyed to, that's where they landed. That was the closest spot after the Red Sea that was outside of Egyptian jurisdiction. In other words, if you've been here, who's been here all four? All, every week we've done out of Egypt. Every week we've done out of, okay, okay, good. This is really going to connect. Okay, so in other words, everything that we've talked about, murder of their children, engulfed in slavery and abuse and pressure, all of the plagues that they've went through, their children literally being ripped from their hands and thrown into the Nile, right? All of this stuff happens. The Lord leads them to the parting of the sea. They get to freedom, and they're standing in the desert of Shur. And three days at, but before that, they're in Shur, right? They're in the wilderness. They got exactly what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected and the results were bitterness. They got exactly what they wanted. Going up against Pharaoh, let my people go ten times, ten plagues, blood cleanses on their way to freedom. They got exactly what they wanted. It was not what they expected. And the results were bitterness. If you were here week one, let me give you some bonus because this right here is the connection, right? To week one, what was Pharaoh's goal? To work these people into the ground so that they experienced bitterness all the time because Pharaoh knew you can't serve God and be bitter at the same time. So Exodus 1, 13 through 14, this is such a cool connection. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter. Same word. They made their lives bitter. That's to work, worship, or serve something other than God. Forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. In other words, make this connection. They got exactly 
what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected. And now they're right back where they started. They got exactly what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected. And now they're in the exact same. They may as well not even have left Egypt. They shouldn't have parted the Red Sea. Why? Because their bodies left Egypt, but their spirit's still stuck in slavery. They're still complaining. They're still bitter. They're still angry. They're still frustrated. Because when you get what you want, and it's not what you expect, you have one of two responses. When you get what... Marriages, do you hear me right now? When you get what you want, oh, they're so chiseled and ripped, and, they're so, and she's, she's so beautiful, and, and he brings me flowers, and she cooks for me. She bakes, you know, like, this is perfect. And then you, you get what you want. It's not what you expect. She ain't cooking for me no more. He don't bring me flowers ever. She don't wear makeup on date night no more. <laughs> He's letting himself go. He quit. Jo- when you get what you want, and it's not what you expected, the response can be bitterness, or when you get what you want, and it's not what you expected, when you get that promotion that you want, right? Right? You want more leadership. You want more influence. When you get that ministry that you want, I hear that all the time. I get that ministry that I want. When you get that ministry that you want, right? Oh, I want to have influence and I want to have people under me and I want God to resource the ministry and I want God to do all of these great things. You get the ministry that you want. It's not what you expected. You're dealing with challenges. You're dealing with the swings and the, the crucible of ministry, which is the hot, the cold, and the rising to the top, and the falling to the and everything in between. And it's not what you expected. You have one of two responses. And one of them will send you right back to where you were. Stuck. Enslaved. Nowhere to go. Or, here's the positive news, right? Here's the the good response. Exodus 15, verse 25. When you get what you want, and it's not what you expect, you have one of two responses. One is bitterness. One is anger. One is frustration. One is complaining. The other one, Exodus 15, verse 25, says, So Moses, here you go, cried out to the Lord for help. Everyone else is complaining and turning against Moses. Moses' response could not be more the opposite. Moses cries out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. You can complain, and you can whine, and you can throw a fit, and you can grow bitter, and you can stay stuck right in the same cycle you've been in for years. Or you can cry out to God and see Him work. You can cry out to God and see a miracle happen. You can cry out to God and see him in one miraculous swoop. Say, take that, water, take that wood, throw it in that water, and all of a sudden you have purity. You have cleanliness. You have what you've been longing for before. So yesterday we went to a Day with Dads event at, at, a, at a prison here in Huntsville. I, I'll be honest with you. I can't remember uh, back to a time where my heart was as touched as I was in this moment. So we're in this room and all of these offenders, they're there and they're sitting at tables and they're waiting to see their children. Some of them for the first time in years. I was talking to one guy, I said, hey, uh, how, how long, how, who do you got coming today? And he said, man, I got my daughter coming. And I mean, this guy was sitting there. He was just, he was ready. And I said, how long has it been since you've seen your daughter? He said, six and a half years. She's 13 now. I said, wow, man. I said, what do you want to give her today? And he said, I want to give her that inner strength that she can make it no matter what's going on around her, what's happening, not cave to the influence, but I want to give her that strength that keeps her going. I said, that's called the blessing of the Father. 
You can trace it from Abraham all the way to Jesus' baptism, and God says, my son, whom I'm well pleased. You could trace it all. That's the blessing of the Father. You give that to her. You put that in her spirit today. Sow that into her. So I'm, I'm watching this, and the doors open up, and these kids come in, and you talk about some hard, tough dudes melted into a puddle of tears. Their kids come walking in. They're hugging their kids. They're embracing their kids. They're playing basketball with their kids. They're playing volleyball with their kids. They're doing board games with their kids, and they're, they're giving their kids that blessing, right? And so I'm talking to another guy, and, and he and I are talking, and he's just saying, this is, this is so life-changing. And I said, tell me about you. And he said, well, he said, uh, I've been in here since I was 17. He's done 20 plus years, life without parole. I said, man. I said, how did Jesus change your life? And he said, man, when I came in here, I was mean. I was fighting. He said, I was always in trouble. I was, I was angry. I was, his words, bitter at the whole world. Thought everyone was against me. He said, I love to fight. I love to be in that chaos and that turmoil. And he said, so I, I was at this different unit. I was getting in all this trouble. And they, they literally, they put me in solitary confinement. He said, I spent eight and a half years in there because I couldn't get myself right. I'm in this box for eight and a half years looking at a white wall. And he said, I, I, he said, I swear to you, the voice of God spoke to my heart and said, is this what you want? You, you realize that, right? That we may not be in that situation, but bitterness and complaining and anger will lock us into a prison. It may be your home. It may be your marriage. It may be your job. It may be wherever it is, but that bitterness and that anger will lock you up and isolate you. So he said, I'm, I'm in there and, and, it was, and I heard God speak to me and say, is this what you want? And he said, I, I said, God, this is not what I want, but I don't know how to pray. I've never read your word, and I don't know what to do right now. And he said, I felt God speak so clearly to my heart. Just submit to me. And he told me this. He said, I fell to my knees in the hole. I spread my arms out, and I looked towards the sky, and I cried out to God. And I said, Lord, if you'll have me, if you'll use me, I'll be your servant. I'll do whatever you want me to do, however you want me to do it. Several years later, he gets out, and he starts writing his mom. His mom told him she wouldn't visit him anymore because when she did, she saw the devil in his eyes. She said, I, I, can't, I can't look at you anymore. I can't come visit you because when I look in your eyes, I see the devil. Starts writing her, telling her he found Jesus. She writes him back, says, you're lying, you're manipulating, you do this all the time. I'm not, I'm not falling for it. Years, he wrote his mom letters until years later, his mom showed up there. And she said, son, he said, what, Ma? I can't believe you're here. And she said, I've given my heart to Jesus because I've seen how Jesus has changed you through these letters. So he leads his mom to Christ there. And then he's writing another friend of his that he's known forever. And he's been writing this friend. And the friend never even responded, never responded. And all of a sudden set up a visit and came to visit him and sat down with him and said, I gave my life to Jesus because of the letters that you've been sending me. And so now he works in the chapel. And he's working in the chapel with these young guys that come in. And they got these sentences. And he is hard. These young guys come in. They're tough. They're hard. They're angry they're bitter and he's saying to them you don't have to be this way I've been where you're at and look at where it landed me and he said something that was so good he said I used to say to myself I've got life what's the point now he says to himself I've got life and I've got a purpose in here to make a difference for the kingdom of God do you realize the shift between crying out to the Lord and staying stuck in complaining. If you will just cry out to God and say, Lord, I'm done living like this. I'm done being like this. I'm done having a hard heart. I'm done being frustrated. I'm done complaining. I'm done being bitter. And I am ready to just serve you. What do you have? God will use you to do a miracle in somebody's life. God will do a miracle in your life. But you have to be willing to realize that you have to quit reverting back to this complaining, bitter spirit and get free. You don't just walk into freedom, but your spirit goes into freedom with you. Let's keep going here. We'll, we'll wrap this up. Exodus 15, 25 through 26. It says, It was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. 
This is really cool. We don't have time to go into all of it, but let me just take you here, okay? So over and over, Exodus 16, Exodus 17, go, to, go all the way through, through the Babylonian captivity. This is the pattern of the children of Israel. God provides for them graciously in the midst of their complaining, and then they continue complaining, continue rebelling. They get themselves in trouble, and God does a work again. Over and over and over, they fail the test. They fail the test. Just do what I say, listen to me, and you will be fine. And they fail it over and over until Matthew chapter 4, 2 through 4. It says, for 40 days and 40 nights. See the foreshadowing here. See the connection here. He fasted and became very hungry. Verse 3. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of of bread. Remember, we, we preach Matthew chapter 4 on, on Bible memory because he quotes scripture, and that's a great sermon, but there's a deeper message here. This is a message to a Jewish nation that kept failing a test of, will you trust me for provision when you have none? So the devil comes to Jesus, and he says, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See this. That was them passing the test. Because Jesus becomes sacrifice for them. And the blood of Jesus covers them. And the, pa- the, the test that they could never pass, the inadequacies that kept rearing up, that kept them from getting to where they need to be, were satisfied in Jesus. If you have come in here today and you feel a sense of inadequacy, like I can't pass the test and I keep trying and I keep pushing for you need to realize the test has already been passed for you. And the victory that you are looking for is found in Jesus. Jesus passes the test, and then we finish Exodus 15, 27. After leaving Marah, the Israelites traveled onto the oasis of Elim. Listen to this. What were they looking for? What were they looking for? Water. The water was bitter. Look at what God does. After they leave, they travel to an oasis of Elim where they found 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They camped there beside the water. Can you imagine? This is exactly what they were asking for. They complain, they fight, they resist, they fail the test, and then God sets up camp at an oasis with palm trees and springs of water. Do you realize that on your path to freedom, God wants to take you to places greater than you want for yourself? God wants to do things in you greater than you desire for yourself. The difference is if you're willing to submit to what God wants to do versus continually fighting and trying to force what you think you want. My son, perfect example, Halloween, right? It's on Thursday. This is on Monday. He's all fired up. He's like, Daddy, Daddy, it's Halloween week. We're going to Halloween. He says to me, one more weekend until Halloween. I was like, no, son, actually, it's just three days. Now, i got to act like a child for a second because you don't get the full picture until you see. Uh, he's saying one more weekend on a Monday, right? Halloween's on Thursday. I said, no, buddy, three more days. Three more days. He says, no. Cue the fall onto the ground, kicking and screaming. And he said, not three, one, one weekend. And I said, son. Three days is shorter than one more weekend. He thinks, he thinks I'm saying to him it's like three times longer. I'm saying to him, no, 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 listen, pal, three days. No, one more weekend. So then I get frustrated, and I'm like, fine, one more weekend, and you'll miss Halloween. He's, no, I can't miss Halloween one more weekend. And I was saying, listen, listen to me. I'm trying to tell you, three days is shorter than one week. But he was so hung up on his way and his numbers and how what he had and what he wanted to do sounded better that he was missing out on the fact that I was trying to make it shorter for him. Do you realize this? God has greater for you. You want water, he's got an oasis. You want provision and he's got abundance. You want what God has. You've just got to submit to God's 
ways and trust him rather than complaining. Follow him rather than bitterness, and you will land at more than you ever asked for in his supply. Everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life, and we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.